Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to learn who Asherah is. Did God have a wife? Let's see. I'm going to share a video with you. And I won't be speaking while the video plays so that the um, audio comes through correctly. Okay. in the Bible and the sky people, the Anunnaki in the Sumerian tablets. The priests who knew how to read the library of Hebrew texts knew that they were full of texts about Asherah and Baal and other powerful entities who had interacted with our ancestors in the deep past. It had to be edited to give the impression of a seamless story of Yahweh, the one and only God, from start to finish, almost airbrushing out of memory the Hebrew story of paleo contact. Tel El Farah, seven miles northeast of Nablus, Palestine. This windswept stony plateau is located high in the rugged mountain country of ancient Samaria. Since the 1940s, this expanse of 45 acres has been an archaeological site, oversighted for three decades by Roland de Vaux, director of the École Biblique et Archéologique Française. It was he who initiated a major excavation here, opening up an incredible window onto the real world of the Bible through an enormous body of physical artifacts. On this site, buildings, decorations, carvings, ornaments, jewelry and figurines were uncovered, giving us eyes on what the ancient Hebrews were seeing, thinking and imagining when they spoke of Elohim, powerful beings from the deep past. Among the archeological finds made here was an extraordinary carving of a nous. A nous is a doorway, but completely out of context. There is nothing behind it. There is no surrounding building. A nous is a really interesting object. The conventional explanation is that this depiction of a doorway represents an entire building, but the building is not depicted. The building is considered to be implied. But if I just describe it to you and say, we're looking at a doorway that appears to go nowhere. There's nothing around it. There's nothing behind it. And yet from this thing that is only a doorway, advanced beings can come through that doorway. Now in contemporary language, we have a word for that. We would call it a portal. Flanking this particular doorway are two inverted palm trees ancient symbols of Asherah. Carvings found at the site showing women baking bread cakes indicates that Tel El Farah was a place of devotion to Asherah. Asherah was a female entity and the archaeological finds that point to Asherah show her as emphatically female. The figures emphasize the vulva, bare breasts, big bouffant hair, she is emphatically female. And more than that, she is a very powerful entity. So many people will know the famous carving of Gilgamesh from the palace of Sargon. Gilgamesh was the crossover king, the king of Uruk, a hybrid king who was the pivot between the ET kings of the deep past and the human kings of our more familiar history. Gilgamesh is this powerful figure, and the carving shows him as being five meters tall. He's holding a lion with one arm, and the scale of this full-grown lion, it looks like a lap cat against Gilgamesh. So it shows him as a very powerful figure, except we have a carving of Asherah 
and she is naked holding two lions by the ears. So she was honored as an advanced being, a powerful being, emphatically female, and credited with our ancestors' tutelage in agronomy. She is the one that the Jewish people of the deep past would give thanks to for our great leap forward. Cultures all around the world carry an ancient memory of humanity's great leap forward. And scientists have long been fascinated by what caused us to suddenly shift from aeons of living in animal subsistence on planet Earth, living like foragers or as hunter-gatherers, to suddenly knowing how to cultivate crops, how to do animal husbandry, how to create agricultural surpluses. Because as soon as you do that, you can settle, you can build cities, you can create a specialized society and develop into a civilization. And what fascinates me is that ancient cultures give credit for that great leap forward, not to their ancestors, but to advanced beings who visited us in the past to give us this knowledge. And many cultures specify that these ancient tutors came from the stars, and some specify which stars they came from. Now, different cultures remember these entities by different names, but very often they're remembered as female entities who gave us this primordial tutelage in agronomy. So you listen to the Zulu people, they'll tell you about Mbabwana Warisa, who taught them how to farm and how to make beer. If you go to ancient Sumeria, the oldest culture that we know anything about through a written record and through archaeological finds, the ancient Sumerians spoke about Shamhat, who met with Enkidu, the primitive human, and taught him about agronomy, farming, sophisticated foods, beer, and living in the city. If you go to Mesoamerica, you'll hear about Hun Hunapu. Asherah is the Bible's version of those figures. Found at archaeological sites across the Levant, ancient clay figurines of Asherah reveal how widespread the cult of her memory really was in the practice of ancient Judaism. Asherah was known by many names. Asherah, Astarte, Hathor, the Lion Lady, the Romans knew her as Venus, the Greeks as Aphrodite. But in other places, she was depicted as an olive tree. Throughout the world of Eastern Orthodoxy, when a church can be found with an olive tree in the courtyard, it is the cult of Asherah that is persisting even within the world of Orthodox Christianity. Asherah was one of many Elohim, or powerful beings, whose existence is recorded in the pages of the Bible. El of Ekron, Akek of Egypt, Dagon of the Philistines, and Yahweh El Shaddai of the tribes of Israel are all included in what the ancient biblical writers called the Tseva Hashemaim. But what was the Tseva Hashemaim? In the Eden Conspiracy, I argue that the Bible when correctly translated according to root meanings of key words, references a whole panoply of entities who visited our ancestors in the deep past. And the Tseva Hashemaim is the Hebrew language for that panoply of visitors. Tseva Hashemaim means the armies of the sky or the airborne armies. There is a memory of advanced technology that brought ancient visitors to planet Earth, some of whom nurtured us in our development as a species, and some of whom dominated us, colonized us, and exploited us. It was a great spectrum of beings with whom our ancestors interacted, and the Tseva Hashemaim is the Hebrew memory of that. The arrival of groups of Tseva Hashemaim is recorded in ancestral narratives all around the world. Greek legend, Nigerian, Zulu, Efik, Edo, 
Norse, Celtic, Indian, Mayan cultures all speak of the arrival of advanced beings from the stars who came in the deep past, some to nurture and support humanity, others to colonize and exploit. But where did they come from? One clue can be found in the Bible, in the ancient book of Job. There's a book in the Bible called Job, and many Bible scholars believe it is the oldest piece of literature within the Bible itself. It's not the beginning of the story, but they argue that it's the oldest manuscript that found its way into the Hebrew canon. Many scholars believe it has Arabian roots. And there's a fascinating verse in that book, which I discovered when I was researching for Escaping from Eden, and it references three particular regions of space. Sirius, Orion, and the Pleiades. And the verse implies that those regions of space exercise a power dynamic over planet Earth. Now, some scholars would say the power dynamic is simply a reference to the stars in the sky and the seasons for planting and harvesting. And you could brush it off with that explanation, except there's something about those three regions of space. Sirius, Orion, Pleiades, are mentioned by cultures all around the world in their ancient narratives as being the place from which our ancient visitors came. Some to nurture us, some to exploit us. Orion is there in the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. Sirius is named by the Dogon people of Mali, West Africa, and the Pleiades by Aboriginal Australian story and Native American story. And there is a very specific connection with the Pleiades in the story of Asherah. Where do the figures of Yahweh and Asherah figure in this great panoply? So I've mentioned that there's this great spectrum of paleo contact experiences, some positive, some less so. When we get to Second Kings and the writings of Jeremiah in the Bible, we're told that the memory of the Jewish people of the 7th and 8th century BCE, the memory of Yahweh was negative. It says they spoke disparagingly of him, they disrespected him, and they disregarded his laws. They rejected his tradition. But they remembered Asherah positively. So much so that on every high hill and under every green tree, there would be installations to commemorate and give thanks to Asherah for her involvement in the human story. And so I think when we put Asherah and Yahweh alongside each other, which has occurred in some ancient carvings, what we're looking at is the two poles of paleo contact. Asherah is the positive nurturer. Yahweh is the lawgiver, the dominator, the controller. And it's interesting that the biblical writers tell us that Asherah is remembered with affection and Yahweh was being rejected because of what the ancient Hebrew people remembered about what life was like under the rulership of Yahweh. So I think they belong together. When you see them together, they are representing the two poles of this very diverse experience of ancient ET contact. Among the possible locations for the origins of Asherah, one in particular is hinted at by the Naus uncovered at Tel El Farah. Carved into the Naus itself is a crescent moon and a cluster of stars. The conventional explanation is that Asherah was worshipped at times of harvest festival, and the crescent moon and the stars represent a kind of calendar identifying the time of year when these celebrations should occur. So one interpretation of the crescent moon and the stars is that we're being given a date, that what we're looking at is a calendar, and the crescent moon represents a new moon, and those stars represent a particular time in the year. And so when that constellation appears in a particular place in the night sky, at the new moon, that's the time of festival. And so the conventional explanation is that the now says, here was a temple to Asherah, 
And then in this engraving, well, that's the time of year when we have our big Asherah festival. Now, all that might be perfectly correct, but I'm going to suggest there's another layer to that symbology because symbology is a language of many layers and a symbol can carry different meanings at different times and in different places. When I was first ordained, I worked in a very high church Anglo-Catholic parish. If you went into one of our services, one of our masses, you would think you were in a Roman Catholic church. It was that traditional. And so we had rituals, we performed ceremonies, we had processions, we wore vestments, which I was told all carried a Christian meaning. And indeed they did. But they happened to carry other meanings as well. An ancient Jewish visitor would come see our reserved sacrament and say, oh, I see that you practice the ritual of the showbread, just as we do in the Jerusalem temple. He'd look at me in all my garb, layers and layers of vestments, and he'd say, oh, I can see your part of the high priesthood of Jerusalem because you're wearing an ancient Roman would observe our processions and say, oh, I can understand all the statements about power and compliance that you're making here. Or someone from ancient Babylon would watch our bishop arrive in purple and say, oh, I can see he's in charge because he's wearing the royal purple chosen by King Cyrus of Persia. And so what we were doing was full of symbology of at least four layers. So there was a Christian meaning, but there was also a Jewish meaning and a Roman meaning and a Babylonian meaning. And so I think it's quite legitimate to look at that symbology on the Naus from Tel Al-Farah and ask, what does that symbology mean in the language of the source culture from ancient Sumeria? It gives a different meaning. In the symbology of ancient Sumeria, that crescent moon is really the stylized bull, and it refers to a constellation, the bull constellation, Taurus. And that group of stars sit by the shoulder of the Taurus constellation. They are the stars of the Pleiades. So I would argue that this Naus is telling us a great deal about Asherah. Firstly, this is where she came. The standing stones tell us Tel El Farah was a place of ancient contact, of first contact for the local peoples. She arrived through a portal from, and here's a star map, the Taurus constellation near the shoulder from the stars of the Pleiades. Asherah came from a planet which orbited one of the stars of the Pleiades. I would argue that's the information carried by that Naus and that star map. Now, I just want to stop right there and say to you, and I don't say this with ego, I say it with joy. <laughs> um, because I'm learning and I'm putting my pieces together too just like I'm helping you put your pieces together and remember who you are. And I came here with a knowing as a very small child. I have always known that I came here from the Pleiadian star system. I can even name the planet. Tigeta is where I came from. And there are actually other people in my family who have those same claims that they came from the planet specifically Tigeta that I only just learned recently about um, just since I've been speaking out publicly about who I am. Um, so I know that I came from Ple the Pleiadian star system. I know that I came from uh, Tigeta. I would tell my parents, uh, my earth parents here present day, when I was a small child, I would tell them, that I came from the stars, that I came from the sky, that I wanted to go home, um, that I came from the Pleiades, that I, I belong to a planet called Tigeta. That's a red planet, but it's beautiful red. It's, it's beautiful reds. The trees are red. You know, the leaves on the trees, the, the grass is red. The moss is shades of red. It's beautiful. 
absolutely stunning. I was born into the birthstone of the ruby, which also represents fertility. I'm the seventh born child, and I have seven children of my own. Would have been 11 if some particular incidents hadn't have happened. Um, but again, were for growth and learning for me to re-remember who I am. I've known for decades that my name is Ashera, Ashera. You know, I, I um, have always been deeply interested in the Sphinx and the origins of the Sphinx. And it is my personal belief and has been for a long time that the Sphinx was actually a female pharaoh, not a male. Um, and it was defaced because it was too big for them to completely destroy. As you'll learn as we watch further into this video, um, men actively destroyed all of uh, the goddess statues and goddess worship, completely wrote it out of history. And... Um, you know, took control. I personally have an entire lifetime in this lifetime of that type of incident where I was written out of the story or um, made obsolete in various ways and unimportant, usually by men, but not always. And um, no hard feelings. There's no issue there. I'm just saying that this is a common theme in my life for a reason. For me to learn who I am, to remember who I am, just as you remember who you are. And we all have equal roles. So please, in no way, shape, or form, try to misconstrue or misunderstand this. That this is ego or pride or me trying to be more important than anyone. I am merely sharing with you as I learn and remember and discover and put my pieces together. So that you can further trust me to help you put your pieces together. Because I have the answers. And I can prove it in so many different tangible ways. I can prove that you are more powerful than you know. So I also really quick wanted to touch on um, an interesting twist to the Garden, and, Garden of Eden story. And... Perhaps even why the um, the CIA has that story classified in their files to where we cannot obtain it and read it. I would like to propose to you that the snake in the Garden of Eden that encouraged Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge, but then let her become aware that she needed clothing, that she was naked. Um, is, in fact, Asherah, who was there to teach them to put clothes on, teach them to grow their foods, teach them to be self-reliant and dignified in the way they carried themselves, and how to go forth and multiply upon this earth and treat this earth as their land to be the caretakers of. And so... To annihilate the mother goddess, to annihilate the one that they held in high regard, who was a nurturing, compassionate leader and teacher. Um, that in order to deface their character, they destroyed all the statues of her. They destroyed all of the written word of her. The Sphinx was not able to be completely destroyed, so they just defaced it. And then for the story of the Bible, because Christianity is the majority rule as far as religions of the world go, thanks to the Roman Catholics. Um, they had to rewrite the story and put a bad guy in place that we call a devil. Not that there's not bad people or bad uh, entities, bad beings that seek to harm us, because they definitely exist, but we're looking at the wrong devil. We're being misconstrued and confused in our lessons and our studies and our learning in order to be able to get the control that we need 
to be who we are. So food for thought. And I'm going to share some more of this video. Now, some might say, well, Paul, that's a stretch. That's one possible reading. And it might be easy to brush off were it not for the fact that so many cultures say that our female tutors in agronomy came in the deep past from the Pleiades. Listen to stories from the Cherokee people. Listen to stories from Aboriginal Australian people. And the Pleiades crops up again and again as the place from which our learning came in our deep past, which enabled us to make the great leap forward. Tel El Farah is such a fascinating site because before we get into the details of the Naus and what it is telling us, we have to identify standing stones that were in that place. And standing stones all around the world were our ancestors' language for marking a place of paleo contact, a place of first contact with advanced beings from the stars. An example in the Bible is the standing stones at Bethel erected by Jacob, when Jacob witnessed Elohim, advanced beings coming from space down to the planet's surface and then returning to space via the ladder. And so he erected those standing stones there. And later, a temple was created there around an altar to give thanks to those entities for what they brought to the human story. So right away, the standing stones at Tel El Farah say, something happened here. Our ancestors met somebody here. And the Naus is there to tell us who it was they did meet. But how did this information about paleo contact in the Bible become lost. Well, there were two kings in particular who were responsible for the cleanup of Judaism, which transformed Judaism from a canon of memory of paleo contact to a religion of monotheism and obedience to law. Hezekiah did a ritual cleanup where he went around, not personally, but he sent the Jerusalem guard to destroy installations commemorating other advanced beings. Josiah was his grandson, and Josiah embarked on a massive cleanup of Judaism. Judaism was to be reformed after he discovered something called the Book of the Laws of Yahweh. Now, this book surfaced during the renovations of the Jerusalem Temple. We don't know what that book was, and we don't know why it had been lost or hidden. But when Josiah discovered the Book of the Laws of Yahweh, he decided Judaism was going to be reformed around the laws in that book. The laws of Yahweh would define what was right, what was wrong, and would also legitimize his rule, because those laws and his adherence to them would explain why he had authority to govern all the people of the tribes of Israel. The laws of Yahweh would explain his divine right as king, why the power of God and the will of God was upon him to rule and to govern. Now, in theory, Josiah could have picked from the whole range of beings in the Tseva Hashemayim. He could have picked Asherah and said that beautiful nurturing entity will be our God. That will be the one we commemorate. That will be the one around whom our devotions will revolve. But no, he picked Yahweh, the figure associated with this book of laws. And the reforms flowed on from then. Now, in his lifetime, it was a ritual reform. And so we're given a verse in 2 Kings that gives us an example of what this looked like. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 23, the narrator tells us this. The king, Josiah, ordered Hilkiah the priest, the priests next in rank, and the gatekeepers, to remove from the temple of Yahweh all the items made for Baal and Asherah, along with all the sky armies that save Ahashamayim.
Josiah's ancestors, particularly King Manasseh, King Ahaz, King Solomon, had all created installations to other advanced beings. They all had to go. Josiah regarded that as idolatry and had no interest in a memory of paleocontact. He wanted to simplify Judaism into a monotheistic religion that would be the imprimatur for his authority in a neatly ordered theocratic society. But the effect of his reforms wasn't just about ritual practice. It was about changing what Jewish people believed about themselves, about God, about their place in the cosmos. But before we pin too much revisionism on Josiah, we need to note when he became king, he was eight years old. Now, to have a king who is purely a ceremonial king, who's only eight years old, is not really a problem. I mean, some might say that's cute. But a king with real power, who's only eight years old, that's another matter. And clearly, such a king has to be guided. There's a parallel in British history when a nine-year-old boy inherited the throne of England. He inherited it at nine years old from his father, King Henry VIII. And that was a moment of crisis in which two powerful families stepped forward to support and advise young King Edward VI. Now, these were families strongly invested in the religious reforms that were going on in England that had been initiated by the old king, Henry VIII. And so they seized the opportunity to guide royal policy and push those reforms forward. In the case of King Josiah, his advisor was Hilkiah, the high priest. Now, by getting rid of all the other temples, altars, standing stones, it effectively got rid of other priesthoods as well, because we forget that Judaism had many priesthoods. There were the priests of Asherah, there were the priests of Baal, and there were the priests of Yahweh. Hilkiah wanted to get rid of the other priesthoods and the other temples, and so those altars were broken, the standing stones were pushed down and broken, the horns of the altars were broken off, Figurines of Asherah had their heads snapped off and they were all confiscated so they could never again be used in commemoration of Asherah. Judaism was paring down to a monotheistic religion with one temple, one high priestly family, one king. And so there's a great centralization of power and wealth because now all the tithes will come to Jerusalem under the charge of the high priestly family. Now, within 23 years of the death of King Josiah, there was no more Jewish monarchy. And so the power over the Jewish nation resided entirely with the Jerusalem temple and the high priestly family. So this was a very strategic shift as the ritual reforms rolled on. And then in the generation that followed, a cleanup of the scriptures themselves. In the century that followed King Josiah, the high priestly family in Jerusalem commissioned a complete revision of the Hebrew canon. The priests who knew how to read the library of Hebrew texts knew that they were full of texts about Asherah and Baal and other powerful entities who had interacted with our ancestors in the deep past. It had to be edited to give the impression of a seamless story of Yahweh, the one and only God, from start to finish. And there's a very broad scholarly consensus that that edit was done in the 6th century BCE to monotheize the Hebrew canon, almost airbrushing out of memory the Hebrew story of paleocontact. Yet within 2 Kings in the book of Jeremiah, there are clear recollections of what Judaism was before the Great Reform. Writing in the 7th to 6th century BCE, the prophet Jeremiah lamented the fact that this was Jewish practice on every high hill and under every green tree, Jeremiah 2.20 and 3.6. Similarly, the narrator of 2 Kings 17 tells us that this remembrance of advanced beings was Jewish practice in every place they lived. 
but alongside each other, these phrases give a clear and unmistakable picture. From every watchtower to every fortified town, and on every high hill and under every green tree, and in every place they lived. This is how normal the commemoration of the advanced beings of the Tseva Hasamayim really was to mainstream Judaism of that time. That moment from 2 Kings 23, when Hilkiah sends the armies in to destroy the reliefs showing the Tseva Hashemayim, all that gets repeated in text form as the Bible got cleaned up and turned into a book about God. And in the Eden conspiracy, I argue that the earlier story is still visible when you go to root meanings of key words. Those key words are the portals into this earlier universe in which our ancestors spoke openly about ET visitors interacting with our ancestors. Before that last edit, the Bible was a canon of paleocontact, in which our ancestors gave us warnings about the non-human hidden hand in the fortunes of humanity, but gave encouragements too for us to know that we have company for us to know that we're part of a bigger cosmic family and that we have help. I believe our ancestors wanted us to have a better experience on planet Earth than they did. And so the education that emerges through this fresh approach to the biblical narratives reveals a rich education in geopolitics, cosmology, emotional intelligence, information about contact, and human potential. In the Eden Conspiracy, I argue that through an approach to translation that centers on root meanings, this education re-emerges to equip us today for a better human experience. And I would like to propose to you that we are in our next great leap forward right now now let's look at a little bit of information that i have found on asherah this is from abc news god had a wife asherah whom the Book of Kings suggests was inside Yahweh in his temple in Israel, according to this Oxford scholar. Not the same person that we just watched the video about. And she is also identified as Jesus' great-grandmother. He bases his theories on ancient texts, amulets, and figurines that have been unearthed primarily in the ancient Canaanite coastal city called Ugaret. This is in modern-day Syria. All of these artifacts reveal that Asherah was a very powerful fertility goddess. Asherah's connections to Yahweh are spelled out in both the Bible and an 8th century BC inscription on pottery that was found in the Sinai Desert at a site called Kuntalet Ardrud. The inscription is a petition for a blessing. Crucially, the inscription asks for a blessing from Yahweh and his Asherah. Here was evidence that presented Yahweh and Asherah as a divine pair. And now a handful of similar inscriptions have since been found, all of which have helped to strengthen the case that God of the Bible had a wife. Some of her powers were immeasurable supernatural strength, capable of rivaling cosmic entities and surpassing the deities themselves. She is much stronger than Michael, the right arm of God, and the prince of darkness, the morning star. Asherah 
I can personally attest to having abilities that come to me with ease that I know that you can obtain as well. Matter of fact, um, people witness this that know me well all the time. They witness these bizarre, incredible things happen around me because I walk and stand in my full power and you could too. I want to teach you. Are you ready to learn? I would also like to add a little bit of my background story for anyone who possibly is a new follower and hasn't watched uh, my videos from years ago when I first began and I would tell my story. I remember also as a child of being visited by my Pleiadian family, specifically my mother and father from the Pleiades and a sister and occasionally two sisters. Their names even are something that I've always known. My father's name was Atlas and his father was Poseidon. My mother of the lifetime before I came here, mind you. Which, well, that's a little complicated too. I didn't technically die to come here. I went into a stasis type thing, but that's another story. Um, but my father was Alice and his father was Poseidon. My mother's name was Ashtanga. And I had two sisters and only two sisters, no brothers. And their names were Ishtar and Alanis. I had been visited numerous times by Alanis and the rest of my family um, on a ship. I remember being on the ship with them when they would come to see me. They didn't take me into the sky or anything. I would just go on board the ship to visit or to learn or to get checkups or whatever. And the captain of the ship was um, a man we called Zulu, or excuse me, Zufu. And um, he was like a, a blue-gray skinned being that was incredibly tall um, with a very long neck and head similar to a giraffe um, is the best way I can describe it to you because um, to my knowledge, no one else has ever stated or documented seeing such a being. And I don't know um, where he comes from exactly. Um, perhaps he comes from the Pleiadian constellation somewhere I just don't know for sure I don't know a lot about him other than um, he's not just the captain of the ship he's very stoic and he's very powerful in his own right and he's very honorable and um, safe I always felt very safe with him um, he was definitely definitely like what you would call a friend of the family you know extended family um, so I just want to add that tidbit to this as well, just so that you have as much information as you possibly can have about me to vet me, to know that this knowledge that I have that's within me and within these pages can truly give you your power back and we can truly change this world and make this our great leap forward in evolution as it is intended to be. And until we see each other again, be well and be blessed in love and light.